first of all, thanks Otmar and, and Gib for inviting me to, uh, to present here today. Uh, what, what I'm going to present is based on my earlier gene paper and, and most of this work has been done jointly with, uh, with Mark Jacobson. And as Larry alluded in his uh, presentation, most of the earlier literature on the so-called double dividend really casts a doubt on the possibility of double dividend, again, defined by the ability of generating a first dividend, that is the improvement in environmental quality, and the second dividend, which is an increase in the efficiency of the tax system. And this is partly because this earlier literature typically demonstrated that there are two forces that perhaps lead to the failure of the double dividend, mainly the fact that the so-called tax interaction effect typically dominates the benefits from revenue recycling, and as a consequence, uh, there is no double dividend from an environmental tax reform. A second consequence of this literature, perhaps more important for this audience and for those engaged in policy decision making, is that as a consequence, perhaps one should think about how to set optimally environmental taxes, and if indeed there is no double dividend from an environmental tax reform, the level of the second best environmental tax should perhaps be below that of the first best Pigouvian tax. What I'm going to do here is to basically remind you that there are two underlying assumptions in this earlier literature that perhaps one should uh, look um, carefully. The first one is that when we look at the production structure of these models, we typically have a fairly simple production structure that ignores the possibility that some goods actually use uh, intensively exhaustible resources, and to the extent that the tax system fails to fully tax the rents that these uh, resources uh, generate, uh, there is essentially a potential for the environmental tax to serve as a surrogate for uh, the, the, uh, the rent tax. And so, as Larry said earlier, one of the reasons for why we might actually indeed generate a double dividend is because perhaps the optimal tax system is not optimal to begin with. In other words, there is this failure to fully tax rents. And so what we are going to do here is to ask three key questions. The first one is what are the implications of these untaxed fixed factors for the magnitudes and signs of the first and second dividends? We will also, by the way, examine how the presence of these fixed factors actually alter the primary cost of the policy. Of course, the second question is what, what does all this mean for the setting of the second best environmental tax relative to the Pigouvian tax? And then if we have time, we will also compare the implications for the discussions uh, regarding alternative public policy instruments, in particular the discussion between non auctionable tradable permits uh, and taxes, as well as alternative recycling schemes, such as returning the revenues of the taxes in a lump sum fashion, vis-a-vis -vis rebating uh, income taxes. Now, unlike the prior two models, which were very detailed, just to set up the stage for the discussion, I, I'm going to essentially develop a fairly simple two-sector static model, where we have three primary agents in the economy, households, uh, government, and firms. And our uh, this is a model of a representative agent who consumes two final goods, a, pollut a polluting good and a non-polluting good, and uh, and we are going to assume that this utility from emissions is separable in utility from private consumption. Now, like earlier literature, those two goods are going to be produced competitively by competitive firms, typically using labor. The key difference here is that the polluting good is also going to use this fixed factor in production. And so as a consequence, we're actually going to introduce some decreasing returns to scale uh, uh, in, in the production function of the polluting good, and we are going to allow for the possibility of rents that are going to be earned by the owners of the fixed factors. And just to simplify, we're going to assume that those owners are our representative agent. Now, the tax system is suboptimal to begin with, partly because it fails to fully tax rents, which I think uh, we could discuss as to whether it's a reasonable assumption or not. And essentially, government levies a proportional income tax. It also taxes emissions to correct for the environmental externality and provides lump sum 
uh, transfers to households. And like the prior two papers, we're also going to assume that government budget balances. This is a very simple static model. Now, to remind you of the effects, let's now consider the overall welfare effects of an environmental tax reform, where I am going to introduce an environmental tax to correct uh, presumably uh, the damage that comes through the emissions, and then I'm gonna use the revenues of those taxes to cut the labor tax. This first diagram uh, represents the market for the polluting good, and as you can see, there is a wedge between the marginal social costs and the private cost, and therefore, let's assume for the time being, we would introduce a tax, a Pigouvian tax, that would generate this rectangle uh, total uh, welfare gain. The primary cost of the policy would be represented by the triangle ADC, and the net welfare gain would be ABC. Of course, the point I want to highlight is that uh, by excluding fix, fixed factors in the production of the polluting good, earlier literature also assumes that whenever you issue an environmental tax, the tax is gonna be fully passed uh, into final prices and therefore into consumers. And now what is important to, to recognize is that in the presence of fixed factors, the environmental tax reform will not be fully passed into households in the form of higher consumer prices because part of the tax will actually act as a surrogate for a rent tax. And so this actually is gonna have several important implications. The first one is that the first dividend can actually be compromised. And the first dividend can be compromised because uh, whenever you issue the tax, to the extent that the tax is not fully passed on to consumers, you may not get the reduction in the polluting good that you were expecting. Similarly, if you want to fix a certain level of reductions in the polluting good, now the primary cost to the economy is gonna be higher, partly because you're gonna have to have a higher level of the environmental tax. Now, let's now look at the labor market. So prior to the introduction of the environmental tax, there was a distortion in the labor market, partly because the wage that is offered to uh, our representative consumer is different than actually the wage that he gets after paying labor taxes. Therefore, we start with this triangle that represents the welfare loss generated in labor markets. And of course, when we introduce the environmental tax, real wages are gonna go down, partly because the prices of the consumer goods would go up, and therefore that would cause a shift in labor supply, generating the so-called interaction effect here given by this rectangle. What is important to note is that in the presence of fixed factors in production, because the price of the final good is not gonna increase by the same level of the tax, there is a potential for a weaker tax interaction effect. So just to summarize, uh, uh, the presence of fixed factors would likely increase the primary costs um, uh, of the policy, and it could actually generate an interesting trade-off between the first dividend and the second dividend. To a certain extent, the less the price of the final good goes up, the more, comp the more you compromise the first dividend, but the more likely you are to get a second dividend because you're not gonna exacerbate as much the distortions with the pre-existing labor tax. And so what I'm going to try to do now is to put some magnitudes, uh, again, in a very sterilized sense uh, for these effects. We're going to assume most of the standard assumptions related to uh, labor supply elasticities as well as uh, the level of the pre-existing uh, labor tax. I'm just gonna note that the size of the polluting sector here is aimed to mimic the size of the electricity sector in the US economy. And we're gonna have a, a, a relative size of the fixed factor by about 25%. And in the simulation model, I'm going to assume that uh, there is a pre-existing rent tax of about 10% and I'm gonna do sensitivity analysis on that. What do you mean by relative size? Uh, relative in the, in the production of the polluting good, relative, share. yeah, share. 
so the first point I want to make here is that in this figure, I want to show you the impact of the fixed factor in the price of the polluting good. So let's consider various levels of the polluting tax and look at the increase in the price of the polluting good. In classical models where uh, the fixed factor is uh, absent, you would get essentially a 45 degree line, partly because the tax is fully passed into higher uh, consumer prices. And here what you see is that uh, in the presence of the fixed factor, this line's actually shifting down. And it's shifting down partly because uh, the effect of the tax is to raise consumer prices by about uh, a 0.85, suggesting that the rest of the effect serves as a rent tax. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, the various welfare effects by looking at the marginal costs, where in the vertical axis I'm uh, looking at a series of percentage emissions reductions, and here I'm, I'm measuring marginal cost as a percent of the income. Uh, the first curve that I want to highlight is this marginal cost prime zero, which is the traditional uh, uh, primary cost of the policy in a world without pre-existing distortions. Uh, when you introduce the fixed factor, you see that that curve shifts up partly because the overall primary cost of the policy go up. In other words, for you to get the same level of emissions reductions, you actually have to increase the level of the environmental tax. I want to point now to MCLS, which is when you use the revenues of the environmental tax to return it them in lump sum fashion in a world where you have fixed factors. And what you can see is that the difference between this prime FF and this curve essentially isolates the magnitude of the tax interaction effect. Now the final curve, which is really the interesting one, is when you use the revenues to cut pre-existing labor taxes, this MCRRFF, and what you have to note is that this curve actually starts negative. Not only that, but it cuts the MC prime at about, uh, at this point here, which basically suggests that up to this point, interactions with the pre-existing tax system actually lowers the overall costs of environmental policies. To take the point one step farther, when you look at the total costs of emissions reductions here relative to primary uh, cost, earlier literature typically suggests that interactions with the tax system here given by total cost RR0 typically increase the cost of environmental policies, take it or leave it, by about 30%. And so the novel aspect here is really this curve, total costs, revenue recycling with fixed factors. And what you can see is that up till about this point, you actually get negative costs, right? Suggesting that there is a potential for uh, what Golder in the, in, the, in the reader's guide called a strong double dividend. It is still the case that up to this point, you still get costs lower than the primary cost of the policy. Now, when we think about comparisons of policy instruments, it's also important to realize that uh, earlier literature point to the fact that using the revenues to reduce pre-existing distortions with a carbon tax actually lower the cost relative to one where you have um, non-auctionable tradable permits. Here we note that that welfare gain is even larger. So as I, as I pointed earlier, uh, uh, this point here is the point uh, that, that suggests that up till this point you're gonna get a strong double dividend, partly because the, the total costs relative to the primary costs are actually negative. Uh, now this leads us to the, to the question, what are the impacts of the fixed factors for the level of the second best tax? And so here we are going to uh, make assumptions related to the benefits of emissions reductions. And so let's suppose levels of Pigouvian emissions reductions. Uh, and here we, in the vertical axis, we will measure optimal second best reductions relative to the Pigouvian level. And what you can see is that it would be optimal to reduce emissions uh, here up till 12% and actually for levels below that, the optimal second best tax can, can actually be at many orders of magnitude higher than the Pigouvian tax. And this is again because the environmental tax is really serving as a surrogate for a rent tax. So in conclusions, uh, 
I think what, what I tried to do in this presentation was to highlight that whenever you complicate the production structure or you allow for suboptimal tax systems to begin with, uh, there's going to be a series of interesting trade-offs between the primary costs, the first and the second dividend um, uh, of environmental tax reforms, and in particular, in the presence of untaxed or at least partially untaxed Ricardian rents, there is a potential for an overall strong double dividend from the environmental uh, tax, um, tax reform. So what this says is that we have another rationale for uh, promoting carbon taxes, even in the absence of clear evidence about the benefits of uh, emissions reductions, at least up to a certain point. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Perhaps it's worth clarifying that there's no direct rent, rent tax here, but the environmental tax is serving as a rent tax by raising the prices of goods in general That's so that the real return to all factors, including the inelastically supplied right. uh, resource, are reduced. And then when, how did you return the revenues in, in this case? Was it just to the other factor is labor here? Yes. Okay. So that shifts the burden then onto labor from 